Generally speaking, I don't share stories like this because I've learned in 30 years of ministry that when God's called you to do something, you need to expect to have people who will come against you. Can I get a witness? When, if God, listen, I'm going to tell you something. Just like we've asked this morning, will somebody please help us teach? We need more teachers for the kids. And you pray about it and God leads you to do that. But let me just, I'm just, I'm not going to paint any rosy picture for you. If you decide you want to help do something like that, the devil will do everything he can to get you to stop. Yeah. And sometimes he uses good, decent people to bring you down. Truth? And so I've learned this over years of pastor and I've had opposition. One thing, I've not learned much, but one thing I've learned about being a pastor is this. After 30 years of ministry, I've found out that there are tons of people out there who think they can do my job better than me. And I hear from them regularly. <laughs> but one thing I've noticed in 30 years is none of them ever go do it. Don't let people discourage you from doing God's work because I'm going to tell you something. The people who beat you up when you're doing your very best are the same people who won't do a thing for the kingdom. Movie critics don't make movies. Amen. If they could make movies, they'd probably be less critical of them, don't you think? And so I've learned that. Well, a few months back, actually it's, it coincided with the beginning of this study in Ephesians. Imagine that because we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. I got a letter. And this letter was, and, and this is what happens when you open yourself up and you have, you know, things going out online and people are watching from different places, uh, you know, then you get, you open yourself up to even more criticism because, you know, generally speaking, the people in your own church kind of like you. Uh, not always, but kind of. And so I got this letter and it was criticizing the fact that I personally am not a big proponent of speaking in tongues or the second blessing or all those things that are very Pentecostal in nature. And I was holding back my church from spiritual blessings. Well, I'll be honest with you. You get, an accusing, you get somebody accuse you like that, it, it, it hurts. And so without, you know, I mean, let me tell you, I'm going to do what God's called me to do, okay? And that's, that's, that's not going to change. But I want you to understand where your pastor comes from, in case you've ever had a question. By the way, there are tons of denominations on this planet, right? And if they believe in Jesus Christ, and they've accepted him as Lord and Savior, they're my brothers and sisters. Right. And there are, there are, I think there's five things we have to agree on to be Christians. The first thing is the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. If he was not born of a virgin, if he was not the son of God and he got in the flesh, then he could not save us. That's an important thing. The second thing is he lived a sinless life. In other words, he never messed up one time. You've got to believe that to be a Christian. His atoning death, he died. He didn't swoon. He didn't pass out. He died graveyard dead on a cross. And that death paid for every sin I've ever committed in my life. Every sin you've ever committed. Matter of fact, he paid for every sin the whole world's ever committed. But you understand when somebody goes to hell, they go to hell with their sins paid for. Yeah. Number four, he rose from the dead. Amen. If the Bible teaches us that if we, we believe in Jesus, but we don't, that he didn't rise from the dead, we're a miserable bunch. So he rose from the dead. Is everybody with me so far? All of y'all believe that, right? Amen. He's coming back. Yeah. Those are the five things you got to have. Those are the five things that make someone a brother or sister in Christ. They have to believe that to be Christians, okay? When people say, oh, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe he was God. I just believe he was a good man. They're not believers, okay? And that's fine. You pray for them. But whether or not you believe in a rapture doesn't save you. I believe in a rapture. If you don't, I'll try to grab you on the way up. <laughs> but those are things we should not fight about. Truth? And another thing that has become very contentious in the church is this whole charismatic thing, speaking in tongues. Now, people look at me and they say, well, you don't speak in tongues, so you must not believe in tongues. I absolutely believe in tongues. But I do not believe that what got started in the charismatic movement in 1900, which is only 120 years ago, is what biblical speaking in tongues is. Now, if that bothers you, I'm sorry, I love you, but I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm sharing my heart. Is it okay if I share my heart? Because here's what happened in Acts when Peter stood up to preach. People had come in from all over the place to come to the Feast of Pentecost because that's what Jews do. They would return home. And a lot of them speak, spoke a ton of different languages. And this ignorant fisherman who spoke Aramaic, and by the way, not very well, 
got up and preached a message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the people who were foreigners in the room, when they heard him preach, they heard it in their language. That is a miracle of God. Amen. And now some people believe that the miracles that, you know, some people are called cessationists. They don't believe those things happen anymore. I do not put God in a box because I have seen it happen in, in other places where someone was praying in English or speaking in English and somebody heard it in Spanish. Okay. I believe God still does. That is tongues. But just to make a noise that is gibberish is not what I think biblical tongues is. Now, the Bible absolutely forbids anyone to speak that way if no one else in the room can understand it. It says you have to have an interpreter. So let, me, let me give you an example because here, here's what you need to understand. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul talks about this. He says, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I am nothing. Now, let me, a lot of people say, okay, well, that shows that there's an angelic tongue out there that Paul knew how to speak. That's really not what he's saying. I'm not saying there's not some language in heaven I don't know. But here's what Paul was saying. Paul was saying, you know what? I can be the best preacher, best speaker in the world. I can speak in every language on earth and every language in heaven. And if I don't have love, it's still junk. Amen. That's what he was saying. Now, let me explain what this, why this is important. Because he goes on, he spends chapters talking about this stuff. And, and here's what he says. He says, I don't want anybody to get up in church and speak in a tongue that nobody else understands. And the reason he says that is this. If I love you, I want you to get all God has for you. If I say that I'm spiritual and listen what I can do and you can't get it, is that love? You see what I'm saying? Let me give you an example. Te amo rey y levanto mi voz para adorar. Any of y'all get that? It's actually Spanish. And it says, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship. Isn't it more helpful if you get it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeshua, Melach Hemelachim. You know what that means? Jesus, King of Kings in Hebrew. Doesn't it help to know? Now, I get up here and do that all day, and other people can do it too. We can get up. I mean, if somebody comes in and speaks Japanese, they can speak Japanese, and they can say good things about Jesus. But the only way it's going to do us any good is if it uplifts the body of Christ. Is everybody good with that? So, if, somebody, if you hear somebody say, your pastor doesn't believe in speaking in tongues, yes, he does. But he also doesn't believe in anybody being left behind. Is everybody okay with that? Don't write me letters. I've already got some. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's this mind, mindset. And it, and it began, like I say, in, in early 1900 where the Pentecostal movement came in. And I, like I say, I, I love my Pentecostal brothers and sisters in Christ. But, you know, I, my job is not just to say yes to everything. My job is to say what is proper doctrine and what is not. And th there was this thing that came in in the Pentecostal movement that basically said, you know, when you're saved, you get the Holy Spirit, but you only get a little bit of him. And later, if you get a second blessing, that puts you on a whole new Christian level. Are we good? They call it the second blessing. And that's when they begin to speak in tongues and do all these things. Well, I find no evidence in Scripture that God pe takes his people and puts them in classes, in ranks. He says, there is neither slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, male nor female. In other words, when you become a Christian, you are equal with every other Christian in the eyes of Jesus Christ. Amen. There's no captains, lieutenants, sergeants. And by the way, your pastor is not better than you. Your pastor is here to serve you. <laughs> would to God that most pastors in this country would begin to understand that their job is to serve their people, not to lord over them. It is our job. To, and here's the deal. If you've been walking with Jesus for 50 years, praise God. But let's say that you're in a church and you've, you've walked with Jesus for 50 years. And a drug addicted prostitute comes down to the altar and says, God, have mercy on me as a sinner. In that moment, in the eyes of God, she and you are equal. And how you can tell if the person who's walked with God for 50 years really has the Spirit of God is he will want her to have everything that he has. Amen. You see that? Because I'm going to tell you something. The day we get to where we think we're spiritually superior to other believers is the day we grieve the Spirit of the Holy God. 
And so that's where I come from. If you want to understand my doctrine, my theology, my theology is this. I believe in justification the moment you, you accept Christ as Savior, which means you, Jesus, you is just as if you've never sinned. And then I believe the Spirit of God begins to work on you in a process called sanctification. Now, if you've been walking with God for 40 years, you should be a little further along in the process, but that does not make you spiritually better because really, if you think about it, who's doing all the work? Are you with me? And this is nuts and bolts. This is, I mean, we'll, we'll get into this a little bit more in the book of Romans, but this is what I believe with all my heart, and I try to live it every day. And if I've ever treated anyone in this room as different, I ask your forgiveness because I, God sees you equal, and I'm going to do my best to see you equal, no matter where you are in your life. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah. So, with that being said, do you need a second blessing? A sec now, we get several fillings of the Holy Spirit. We, basically, we've talked about what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to surrender your will over to His daily. There are days I get a little bit selfish and I try to crawl back on the throne of my life. Can I get a witness? Amen. Lord, I'm really not liking where you're taking me. I think I need to run this one for a while. Okay? Biggest mistake you'll ever make, but we do it. Truth? And so... The Spirit of God is there all the time. He doesn't go away, and there's not a second level of blessings, but there is continuous feelings of the Holy Spirit as we submit to His will daily. And that's what it means to put on the armor. So, if you have the Spirit of God, do you have all that you need to pray in the Spirit of God? Yes. Amen. Thank you. You don't have to wait till sometime down the road for you to get your second blessing before you can pray in the Spirit. Are you with me? So some people will teach you that, you know, if you pray in the Spirit of God, you've got to be able to speak in tongues. You've got to be able to do all this stuff. That's not what praying in the Spirit is. And by the way, God has never designed his gospel so that regular folks can't get it. Matter of fact, he's designed his gospel in a way that the regular folks usually get it before the smart ones. <laughs> the ones the ones that think they're all that in a bucket of chips, Right. God has designed his, his word in a way that regular folks get it quicker than anybody. And I don't know about you, praise God, I'm a regular folk. Yeah. 